We saw a total of eight NBA players go down with Achilles rupture injuries in this 2024 NBA season, a staggering 488% increase compared to the historical average, and it all occurred on the same exact mechanism. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Nov. Today, we're gonna to be doing a comprehensive breakdown, starting with the data and the epidemiology. Then we'll be dissecting a cadaver and taking a look at things microscopically and discussing how each player likely sustained their individual injuries, leading theories to why the incidence has gone up. And we'll be investigating what the data say about the shoes when discussing high tops versus low tops heel to toe drops, different midsoles amongst others. And lastly, we teamed up with the prehab guys and Dr. Wesley Wang to bring you evidence-based exercises for the prevention and rehab of Achilles injuries. Let's break this down. All eight of this year's injuries had the same exact mechanism occurring during a false step, AKA backward step. This is a reactive movement athletes use to accelerate quickly from a stationary or neutral stance. It forces the ankle into rapid deep dorsiflexion as seen here. Interesting enough, nearly all of basketball related Achilles tendon ruptures occur with this mechanism. In order to understand this, we have to start with the Achilles calf complex anatomy and its function. Calf muscles are are comprised of the lateral and medial gastrocnemius and the soleus. These insert into the Achilles tendon, which attach to the heel or the calcaneus bone, enabling plantar flexion, which allows for push off. When the calf muscles contract, they pull the Achilles, which pulls the heel to create plantar flexion, functioning like a biological spring. Ruptures most commonly occur right here, where the soleus joins the tendon, a region with the porous blood supply, a full tear here makes plantar flexion impossible. Understanding fascia and connective tissue is also key. This is a real Achilles, the body's thickest and strongest tendon connecting the calf complex to the heel. Both the outer and inner muscle bellies are wrapped in fascia and connective tissue which extend beyond the fibers to form the tendon. This peritendinous sheath allows the tendon to glide, conducts force, senses tension, and stabilizes nearby structures. Restriction or thickening in these fascial planes from scar tissue overuse or poor mobility increases risk of injury. During these false steps, data suggests that if the angle between the tibia and the foot is any smaller than 48 degrees, there's a strong association with a heightened risk of Achilles injury. NBA data also shows that Achilles ruptures were occurring approximately 1.36 times per year between 1990 to last year, with no year having more than three of these injuries. Flash forward to this year, we had eight. That's a 488% increase from the historical average. One of the largest US studies on Achilles ruptures using emergency room data found that basketball causes around 47% of all Achilles injuries in athletes under 60, and it also showed a statistically significant 39% rise in ruptures over just four years echoing previous studies that showed a similar trend. One systematic review that analyzed Achilles tendon ruptures in the NBA showed the average age that they occurred was around 28.3. About 59% of these injuries occurred in players with a BMI above 25. 61% also tended to occur in the early stages of the basketball year when activity was initially being ramped up. Another systematic review on the general population that went through over 5,000 publications found at least limited evidence for nine identifiable risk factors for increased risk. These included prior lower limb tendinopathy or fracture, use of fluoroquinolone antibiotics, moderate alcohol use, training during cold weather, decreased isokinetic plantar flexor strength, abnormal gait pattern and more lateral foot rollover. So if these injuries are occurring almost entirely via one mechanism at a much higher rate in basketball than any other sport, what's causing them and how can they be prevented? Hey guys, if you're enjoying this video and you're learning something new, give it a huge thumbs up and don't forget to smash that subscribe button. It's a great zero cost way to help our family grow. We appreciate it. Much love. I'm bringing you a real human cadaver Achilles tendon to 
help illustrate the single most likely contributor to these injuries, if you looked at a freshly torn Achilles tendon under the microscope, you'd find 97% of them show pre-existing degeneration, meaning they were already weakened before the actual moment of complete rupture. It's highly likely that all eight Achilles ruptures this season involved overuse related degeneration, especially in the case of Jason Tatum and Tyrese Halliburton. Tatum coming off a deep playoff run in a championship joined Halley weeks later to play in the Summer Olympics. They both played more than 72 games in the 2024 regular season and this was followed by deep playoff runs on both fronts. This level of volume is highly predictive of some form of Achilles tendonitis. Halliburton's calf strain likely stemmed from this load and playing through it in the finals made an Achilles rupture far more likely. You can imagine if you already have a tear in this region, the strain compromises the muscular protection and coordination of the Achilles complex. This leads to excess tensile load on the Achilles, poor shock absorption, and asynchronous firing. This is why one sudden forceful movement can overwhelm the compromised tendon, causing it to completely snap and rupture. In Dame's case, he had a DVT-related absence, during which he couldn't play contact sports. Though the blood clot occurred in the opposite leg, it did cause a period of immobilization. On return, he faced a sudden spike in intensity and minutes, an abrupt load increase that likely contributed to his rupture. Aside from Halley, two other Pacers tore their Achilles, a first in NBA history, likely tied to Indiana's league-leading pace. Pacers led in passes per 24 minutes in the regular season and player miles per possession in 24 minutes in the playoffs. This favors increased total motion, more off-ball screens, cuts, a much higher tempo, and tons of transition baskets, all of which accumulate tendon stress. Modern spacing adds to this. Prior to 2010, it was common to see offensive sequences occurring inside the three-point line, and mid-range jump shots were far more common. This created less space overall between between offensive players when compared to today's game. Nowadays, it's common to see players pull up from the logo and screens being set well outside the three-point line. This creates more distance between teammates, which can force defenders into hard closeouts. Offensively, it invites sudden stops, jab steps, and euro steps, movements that trigger false steps and constrain the calf Achilles chain. You know, especially in the United States, sports, youth sports has been commercialized. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, when I grew up, you play soccer and hockey in the winter, you play baseball, box lacrosse in the summer, and it costs you like a hundred bucks a season for each sport. Well, somebody, some entrepreneur, someone says, well, I need to make a, make a business of this, said, well, if I can sell the dream to the family, the, the little Sarah mm -hmm. or Johnny, you know, they might have a chance to go somewhere with this, but they got to commit to this sport for the year and yeah, six, that's the seven, worst. eight. That's the worst thing you can do. Right? All eight of the athletes that suffered this injury grew up in the United States. Players at younger ages, like the age of five or six years old, are now playing only a single sport, and that might be for 10 to 12 months out of the entire year. This means there's less variance in different surfaces that they're playing on. And if they're only playing basketball for 10 to 12 months out of the year, they're on harder surfaces for longer amounts of time than ever previously known in history. We did look at the data, which suggests at least 47% of all sports related Achilles tendon injuries occurs on basketball courts. This is one area that needs to be studied more and there's very limited data on it. Physical therapists in the NBA have also been speaking out and listing additional factors like the NBA calendar being primarily built around TV deals and not human physiology, staff burnout, less time for player development and injury prevention, and training decisions being made around soreness tolerance and short-term availability over building long-term resilience. Is it the shoes? Money's gotta be the shoes. Shoes. Biomechanical evidence suggests shoe design can influence tendon loading. Moderate evidence shows that shoes with a greater than eight millimeter heel to toe drop and good cushioning reduce Achilles stress by limiting dorsiflexion. In contrast, low heel to toe drop shoes that favor forefoot dominant play are often stiff, flat, or plated. For example, Jason Tatum's first Jordan 
Chu was completely designed around aggressive forefoot play. This teardown from Foot Dr. Zach here on YouTube shows how the TPU chassis, forefoot zoom, and winged strobe came together to help enhance speed and explosive push off, but also makes athletes play more on the balls of their feet. Some theories suggest shoes that favor forefoot play, possibly increasing plantar flexion demand and Achilles load over time. Emerging moderate to low quality evidence suggests midsole stiffness and toe spring angle may affect Achilles loading during push off. Stiffer midsoles, especially carbon fiber plates, reduce push off effort and improve efficiency via a diving board effect, but they also increase Achilles force output in less time, theoretically raising tendon stress. Some doctors prefer plastic shanks with mild flex for this reason. Higher toe spring angles on shoes may reduce tendon work, possibly leading to deconditioning and compensatory Achilles strain over time, especially in high volume athletes. NBA Achilles ruptured data shows no consistent link to shoe brand, model, or collar height. There's no strong evidence that high tops prevent Achilles injuries compared to low tops, meaning shoe height isn't clearly protective or harmful to tendon integrity. It's worth examining whether any athletes were on chronic or high dose anti-inflammatories like corticosteroids or NSAIDs or fluoroquinolone antibiotics, all of which are known to weaken tendon and ligament strength. And lastly, no evidence supports that wearing the number zero can increase that risk. We teamed up with the prehab guys and Dr. Wesley Wang to bring you evidence-based exercises for the prevention and rehab of Achilles injuries. This exercise protocol is progressive and in chronological order. We've also listed a degree of difficulty meter next to each exercise that might assist with identifying which exercises are for beginners and which ones are more advanced. These should only be done under the direct supervision of a professional. When treating or preventing Achilles injuries, one of the first steps is assessing the tendon and evaluating the kinetic chain. How your body generates, transfers, and absorbs force. It also reveals how your brain recruits muscles, joints, and fascia in sequence to produce movement. Today, we're focusing on the posterior chain, the glutes, hamstring, calves, spine, and back muscles. Any disruption in the chain leads to load shifts and neuromuscular compensation. Deficits in the hip extensors, core, foot and ankle control, or weak soleus strength can raise tensile and shear forces on the Achilles, subsequently raising injury risk. Rehab and prevention exercises have significant overlap. The key difference is timing and progression. Starting with simple isometrics, the supine calf isometric hold with a band is a great place to start. Progressing to double legged heel raise holds, then single leg holds, and eventually adding weight, then a soleus overcoming iso hold. Moving to eccentrics or negatives, eccentric single leg heel raise. These can be optionally done at an incline. And progressing to add weight. Then into more advanced dynamic movements like these reverse step downs. Isotonic exercises, low impact examples are these isotonic heel raise step offs. And progressing to add weight. And more advanced heel raise with the front foot elevated. Concentric exercises, Bulgarian soleus raise with progression to weighted single leg calf raises and K-box heel raises. Plyometrics, low intensity includes double leg pogos, staggering pogos, single leg pogos, and start stops that focuses on the braking system single leg bounding tailored to enhance unilateral power 
That's it for today, folks. If you guys enjoyed this video, give it a huge thumbs up. I'm leaving the links to each of the referenced studies down below in the description. This video took a ton of research and I'd like to shout out Jeannie Buss for giving us a follow on Instagram after we dropped this Achilles tendon series. I'm grateful that all this research and all this education is reaching the masses, including you know me being a diehard Laker fan, the Buss family. So uh, we appreciate the support and until next time, Stay happy and healthy.